Hi, I'm Karan Thapar. Over the last few years, I hope you've been watching my program, The Interview on the Wire. During that period, I've interviewed doctors, politicians, businessmen, scientists, authors, and even the occasional Nobel laureate. For me, it's been exciting. I hope it's been enjoyable for you. But these, as you know, are tough times. And if this program is going to remain bold, independent, and sometimes even defiant, then I think we need your support. At the end of the day, it's a truism, but editorial independence is best defended by the viewers. So if you would like this program to remain the way it is, forthright, outspoken, and interesting, then would you consider supporting us? All you have to do is to click on the description at the bottom. But more than anything else, I hope you will continue to watch the interview. Your viewership means an awful lot to me. Hello and welcome to a special interview for The Wire, the BBC documentary on the 2002 killings in Gujarat, which also raises the question, allegedly, could Narendra Modi have been involved, has sparked a storm of controversy. The government has accused the BBC of bias and prejudice. It's accused the BBC of having a colonial mindset. And unnamed sources speaking to several newspapers have claimed that the BBC has cast aspersions on the integrity and authority and credibility of the Supreme Court. And more importantly, that the BBC documentary has endangered the sovereignty and integrity of India. And most recently of all, the government has blocked the BBC documentary on YouTube and Twitter. So today we ask, is this understandable and justified, or is it a flagrant violation of India's constitutional and democratic rights, amounting to unacceptable censorship? Joining me for this discussion is one of India's most highly regarded journalists, the former editor-in-chief and publisher of The Hindu, N. Ram. Mr. Ram, let me start by asking, what is your considered opinion of the BBC documentary called India, The Modi Question? Part one of that went out last Tuesday. Part two will be tomorrow, Tuesday night. But what is your considered opinion of part one? Karan, uh, I, I watched it carefully more than once. It's a, a carefully researched, rigorously researched, well-presented piece of investigative journalism. There's no question about it. Uh, they followed every rule in the book for investigative journalism. Uh, they tried to identify sources where it was possible, where it was not. They make it very clear. They Ask the other side if somebody, you know, if, if some allegation was made, they gave every chance to the other side to respond. Uh, they've made it clear the government of India, uh, you know, was, was asked for a response and they, you know, denied. They didn't want to do it. They denied the request. It's very carefully researched. And uh, it's, a, it's a very good piece of investigative journalism. And I think the attempt is really, I mean, people haven't, uh, must be clear what it's about. It's about what can be called the uh, genetic connection between 2002 and the present. That's what the documentary seeks to do. Part two, I think, is going to be on uh, 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 the handling of the, you know, Mr. Modi, the Modi government's uh, handling of the what can be called the Muslim question, particularly after 2019, after he was re-elected with a bigger majority. So that's what the documentary is about. Not all these things that have been you know, hurled at the documentary, especially by those who haven't seen it. Let me put to you one by one the criticisms made, and I'll first put to you the criticisms made by Arindam Bhakti, the foreign ministry spokesperson. After that, I'll come to the criticisms made by unnamed spokespersons, but they were made virtually to every newspaper in the country. Now, without seeing the documentary, and that's an important point, without seeing the documentary, the foreign ministry spokesperson Arindam Bhakti has called it a propaganda piece designed to push a particular discredited narrative, and he accuses it of bias and lack of objectivity. How do you respond to that criticism by Mr. Bhakti? 
the ultimate subjective, when you say that uh, you haven't seen it, but it's not objective. I mean, it's it could be an Orwellian in an Orwellian scenario, or maybe Alice in Wonderland. I don't know which, but it also reminds me of the these attacks on uh, Salman Rushdie's uh, satanic verses, the fatwa and people who, who call for his head, uh, saying that we haven't seen it and we'll never see it. We'll never see such filth. So uh, I mean, it's it speaks for itself, and uh, I don't know why, Mr. Bakchi, perhaps he was put in an unenviable position by his bosses. He uh, has to say it, but uh, it is it, it is making a it makes a laughing stock of uh, of the role of a spokesperson who says I haven't seen it, but it's not objective. This and that colonial mindset, all that all that stuff. So it is. Uh, it is. Come to that point about colonial mindset, because that's another point made by Mr. Makji. He's accused the BBC of a colonial mindset. Does the BBC have a colonial mindset in your eyes? And is it revealed or exhibited through this documentary? Not at all. I think this was an Im impenetrable and bizarre comment. I don't know where they pulled it out of the hat. What is a Of course, the colonial mindset exists. And the other day in your interview with uh, uh, the f former British uh, Foreign Secretary, Jack Straw, uh, he, he came out very clearly about the racism that colonialism had, the oppression, uh, came out clearly on the side of the Indian people. And he's part of that documentary. So I think uh, to say that uh, this piece of in this uh, investigative journalism is, uh, reflects a colonial mindset, it's just uh, an impenetrable comment. Now, let's come to comments made to virtually every newspaper in the country, but by unidentified officials. First of all, they claim that this documentary is an attempt to cast aspersions on the authority and credibility of the Supreme Court of India. Again, do you accept that? Is the documentary challenging or casting aspersions on our Supreme Court? Far from it. I don't know what they to, what documentary they've seen or not seen or what imagine they've seen, because uh, it it reports objectively, factually, that uh, a special investigation team was sent up. They couldn't find evidence uh, to justify prosecution, and the Supreme Court uh, accepted that, and that was the Supreme Court's verdict. There's no, there's no attack on the Supreme Court, not even criticism of the Supreme Court. Of course, they say problem remains because not even enough evidence was found, according to this. Uh, also, I think there's no harm in criticizing a Supreme, the Supreme Court for particular judgments, or even the way, you know, people have said it's, at, at some point it became an executive court. You can't question the motives of, uh, of a judge, but you can certainly sharply and vigorously criticize the, the reasoning behind the, 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 the decisions. So uh, on all counts, this fails. It is no attack on the Supreme Court. The Supreme, it is just reported factually. I saw it very carefully, on, particularly on, on that point after we talked about it earlier. And uh, there is, uh, again, an impenetrable uh, objection. The important thing you've made, and I'll repeat it for the audience, is that this documentary includes that the Supreme Court accepted the SIT report which exonerated Mr. Modi. That's part of the documentary. And therefore, to say that the documentary is casting aspersions on the credibility or authority of the Supreme Court is ridiculous because the documentary itself acknowledges what the Supreme Court ruled. So frankly, this comment by unnamed officials is once again reflecting the fact that they haven't seen, or if they've seen, they haven't understood the documentary. Yeah, uh, moreover, no, there's nothing wrong in criticizing the Supreme Court. I'd add that because that's important. We're, we're there to do it. Supposing they had experts or politicians discuss this issue and somebody criticized the Supreme Court, there's nothing wrong with that. There, wouldn't, there would have been nothing wrong with it. But the point is, it's not that. That has not Absolutely. happened in this documentary. Now, finally, these unnamed sources, and I'll emphasize once again that they were in virtually every single paper yesterday, have accused the documentary of undermining the sovereignty and integrity of India. Does the documentary do that? Of course not. <laughs> Nobody has uh, talked about uh, Muslims or anyone seceding, wanting to leave India and so on. Uh, there's no attack on the territorial integrity of India or the sovereignty of India. This is an investigative piece, which, uh, has, as I, I, I repeat, has followed every rule 
in, in the professional, uh, you know, the rule book, the playbook, if you like, uh, for investigative journalism. Uh, they try to identify sources where it is possible. That's uh, that, that's that's very clear. This moving scene about, uh, you know, this man, uh, you know, first of all, the Yorkshire people, Im Imran Dawood, that's, you know, you and I discussed it. This is something new that, uh, and, I know, it's not really known what happened to his uncles, Imran Dawood's uncles and, and his next door neighbor, Muhammad, uh, and uh, their attempts to uh, get justice done, their attempts to get an arrest warrant when uh, Mr. Modi visited uh, the UK and why it failed, uh, the discussions with the lawyer, and then the very moving um, uh, you know, you know, scenes of this man visiting the house. That's, I think, the most powerful part of the documentary. Uh, so it's is really very, very good investigative journalism. And then the the central narrator, Jill McGavering, uh, you know, young uh, young Jill, and now commenting on it. I think it's it's done brilliantly. I would say. Okay, uh, let's so then move beyond analysis. the criticism is made of the BBC or the documentary either by Arindam Bhakti, the foreign office spokesperson, or by these unidentified sources who spoke to every single newspaper. Let me come to something now that the documentary reveals for the first time, which was not known until the documentary was seen. It reveals that in 2002, the British High Commission carried out an inquiry into the killings and then filed a report to the Foreign Office in London. Jack Straw, who was the British Foreign Secretary in 2002, has said that it was incumbent on the British government to inquire into the riots because Britain has a sizable population of Gujarati Muslims who had made representations to the government. Now, people have questioned whether this inquiry by the British High Commission was an intervention and interference into India's domestic affairs. Do you accept the Jack Straw justification as a legitimate justification? And do you believe that the British High Commission was doing something that it was legitimately required to do because British citizens in sizable numbers are Gujarati Muslims and they were concerned. Absolutely. That's, I think, uh, a very important part. I think the, the, I think that's the really new thing. That's perhaps the most important thing that came out that the UK government and in particular Jack Straw, the foreign secretary, was very, who was very close to India, uh, uh, was so concerned that they asked, uh, asked for this inquiry and the high commissioner then uh, uh, you know, uh, actualized it, and this is a you know this is a, this is an exclusive for the first time. The key findings of the inquiry, including the comments, uh, have been made public. Uh, the explanation of why they did it, of course, it was not uh, interference. They were, they had a legitimate role in India, uh, and uh, there are, uh, Jack Straw says also in the interview in a, your interview with him that uh, there are hundreds of thousands of Gujaratis. In, uh, in the UK, including in his constituency. Uh, and uh, many of them uh, are Muslims. Uh, so we have, uh, you know, uh, so we have to, we are responsible, uh, we have to, uh, you know, for uh, their concerns and so on. This is part of uh, foreign policy. This is part of international diplomacy. Every major country does it. India has done it. Otherwise, in India, for example, on Sri Lanka, the uh, Tamils of recent Indian origin, India, uh, you know, from the Indira Gandhi's days, India took a, a deep interest in their well-being in Sri Lanka, uh, had negotiations with the Sri Lankan government, had, not to mention the uh, Sri Lankan Tamil question, people who claim they are indigenous, not really part of India, and yet India took a very deep, uh, it got deeply embroiled uh, it's, uh, in the theater of conflict also by sending the IPKF. So to question uh, an inquiry, that uh, concerns many of uh, the UK citizens of Gujarati origin, diaspora, if you like, people who are important uh, in their constituencies, also for their elections, is a perfectly legitimate thing. And I'm astonished that unnamed officials have, uh, uh, have raised this as an objection. And Jack Straw is entirely uh, right when he puts it. He, they didn't overdo it. He said there's no question of breaking relations with India. 
I was very, he told you, he said in the, inter your, the interview, which I watched carefully, that I was very careful on what I said publicly. Absolutely. This is the least any government could do. Let me point out that there's no difference in the British High Commission carrying out an inquiry about what has happened to Muslims in Gujarat because it has deep concerns and representations made by British citizens who are Gujarati Muslims. There's no difference between that and the enormous interest Prime Minister Modi personally takes in the diaspora, who he goes out of his way to meet, many of whom are no longer Indian citizens. But we arrange special meetings for them to meet them. He makes special addresses to them. And once again, no foreign government says you're interfering with our citizenry because these are now no longer Indian citizens. They are in many instances American or British or French or whatever citizen. There's no difference between the two. If we can be interested in our diaspora because their origin is Indian, then the British have every right to follow through the concerns that their citizens have because they originated in Gujarat. Let me move now to a second criticism that's made and put it to you. Was the BBC justified in making this documentary on the Gujarat killings 21 years after they happened? Or is it guilty of deliberately raking up an old and forgotten issue, which is what its detractors have claimed? Karan, there's no statute of limitation on the truth or attempts to find the truth. Historians do it all the time. Journalists do it all the time. And obviously, I'm, I'm speculating here. One of the things that uh, would, would have encouraged them to go deep into it was uh, the discovery of this uh, uh, document, the Foreign Office document, the inquiry report, which for the first time, uh, you know, journalists have been able to access and read and present to the public. So uh, there's no problem. And as I mentioned earlier, the whole, you know, if you look at par, uh, the, uh, the second uh, second part, second episode in the series, two part series, it's going to end with two, it, it seems. Uh, it's about the genetic, uh, you know, whether there's a genetic connection between what happened in 2002. And in fact, they go, there's a backstory to it, Mr. Modi's uh, backstory, and the present, particularly post 2019, uh, on, on what can be called the Muslim, the Mr. Modi and the Muslim question, or the BJP government and the Muslim question. So let me then come a perfectly now. legitimate, perfectly legitimate line of inquiry. I take that point. Let me come now to the government's attempts to block the documentary on YouTube and Twitter. Is this understandable, or in your eyes, is this a flagrant breach of India's democratic and constitutional rights, tantamount to unacceptable censorship? Absolutely. This is not only tantamount to uh, unacceptable censorship, this is going further and going over the top. Uh, you know, what would a mature government have done? What would a government which, uh, uh, which understands the implications of what, uh, what it does, uh, what would it have done? Imagine that scenario. They would have perhaps said no comment, or they would have said we disagree with it, uh, and so on. But here they've gone, uh, you know, they've gone ballistic. And uh, anonymous, uh, unnamed sources, confidential, so-called uh, confidential sources have uh, gone to town briefing journalists and putting out all kinds of nonsense, nonsensical objections. Uh, and uh, uh, But the blocking, also this is going to be ineffective. You and I know that uh, it was BBC Studios which uh, had the, uh, the YouTube uh, uh, you know, the YouTube links, the live links removed because copyright was infringed. It happens all the time uh, I mean, because YouTube, you know, iPlayer can't be viewed in India. Uh, we know that. So, but there are, uh, YouTube does manage to put up, uh, put up the story, put up the documentary and uh, that's been blocked. To what, to what avail? What is the sense of this? Doing this and Twitter as well. So, it's not only censorship, it's a very, uh, it, it's an own goal, which will give you a very bad reputation uh, in dealing, uh, you know, when people uh, look at your, uh, you know, how you deal with the social media and how you deal with information at large, now, scaled up on these platforms. Under Rule 16 of the IT Rules of 2021, the government can exercise emergency powers and block this documentary 
if, and this is very important, if it threatens national security or public order. Does this documentary in any way threaten national security or public order? Of course it doesn't. Uh, and uh, this is a, an abuse of a rule which is already bad. This emergency powers to remove, I suppose, in a situation of war or something, uh, you, you could, you know, you could conceivably justify uh, the use of emergency powers like that. It happens in war in many countries. But uh, uh, we haven't been in that situation. So an already bad rule is being abused in, in, a, in a disgraceful manner. And I think it's, uh, uh, but then it's not, you know, it's not going to, uh, it's of no avail or little avail. Okay. Uh, that because uh, uh, many of these would have been taken out anyway for copyright copyright reasons, and and people will find ways to see it. In these fact, unknown sources because the based. documentary has been blocked by the government, the desire to see it, the curiosity to see it, will oddly enough and perversely from the government's point of view grow. The got yes. they've attracted attention to something where they would have been better served if they'd been silent and ignored it. Yes, yes, <laughs> absolutely. Let we know that up. from uh, the banning of books. The best, the best thing for a publisher or an author, who, unless they're very famous, is to have a book uh, called into question and demands made to ban it. Then you get a lot of publicity, uh, and then more people want to read it who wouldn't uh, otherwise have uh, wanted to read it. Let me pick up on that point you made that this is an own goal by the government. The banning is an own goal by the government. I want to raise two quick questions before I end. To ban on the grounds that this documentary threatens national security or public order surely is suggesting to the world that India is a very fragile country. That a documentary that hasn't been broadcast in India that has only been seen by a few people who have access to Twitter or YouTube, and therefore a fraction of the country at most has seen it. And yet, if you believe this documentary, because just a fraction have seen it can threaten national security and public order, then you're also suggesting India is a very fragile country. Surely that is the wrong message for the government to give either to the Indian people or to the world outside. Yes, uh, that is precisely the message that will go out. Uh, we already have uh, a very poor reputation, the, the, the present government, India under the present government, for uh, tolerating dissent. We, we figure very low, very poorly in uh, international rankings when it comes to free speech or even democracy, you know, your democratic credentials. India ranks 150 out of uh, uh, 185 in uh, in uh, in a, in, a, in a ranking by the Reporters Without Borders when it comes to free speech, just a little bit over Pakistan, uh, so on. And this is going to make it much worse. Uh, so your international image is going to take uh, another beating because of this. And people who then see the documentary and see how carefully it's been done, how balanced it is when assessing information, how, how they follow the you know the rule book for investigative journalism, how they've handled sources, what 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 they are actually saying, what uh, Jill McGevering is saying, what the scenes are in the documentary, which are very moving, uh, and uh, and the fact that uh, justice has not yet been rendered to these families, for example, the Yorkshire family, the Daoud family, I think they're going to wonder what on earth uh, are they talking about. Let me pick uh, up on that. When, when you know that the spokesperson is not, hasn't seen it and made all these comments. Poor man. Maybe he was forced to do it. <laughs> and sympathize with Mr. Bhakti. Let me pick up on that last point and that will be my last question. What impact will A, the Modi government's statements about the documentary and B, the government's attempt to block and ban it have on India's international image and in particular on a boast that we all are proud of, and the Modi government in particular frequently makes, that India is the world's largest democracy. What will people think of the world's largest democracy when they realize that the government is banning a critical documentary which hasn't been shown in the country and only a fraction of people on YouTube have seen? What image will that cast upon India's claim to be the world's largest democracy? 
Yeah, we we have elections, but otherwise we are in the company. We are seen to be in the company of uh, Turkey uh, and uh, us, Hungary and Egypt and so on. Where there there are, I mean, there are formal elections, but uh, there are authoritarian rulers: Erdogan in Turkey, Sisi in uh, Egypt, Orban in Hungary, and there are, and there's a list. I'm not talking about countries like Saudi Arabia or UAE where there are no elections. No serious elections. I'm talking about electoral electoral systems where democracy is uh, is under pressure, is under assault. It's, it's uh, democratic institutions have been undermined as they have in India. There's a whole literature on it, and this is only going to make it worse. This is uh, this uh, for, for not only critics but people who judge this uh, and rank rank uh, rank India on you know uh, using the, the indicators for. Uh, what, what is a democracy? So it's going to be very bad for our image. Uh, had they again, what would what what would you and I? What would a sensible government have done? What would a sober decision maker have done here? They would have looked into it. They can say we don't disagree with this or disagree with it, or they can say no comment uh, on this and let it go. And the and now they have called international attention to this. Every. You, every you know the media and every country is going to report this has already reported this probably in my many languages so this is really asking you know something very acratic acratia is you do something you know is not for your good you know something that you know it's wrong and yet you do it all the time absolutely so think, uh, and the irony is that the government has itself by this action punctured its own boast that India is the world's largest democracy. And what is also yeah. done is to corroborate yeah. the judgment taken by international institutions that we are an electoral autocracy or only a partly free democracy. It strengthened yeah. its critics and undermined itself. And at a time when we are going to chair the G20 and you've seen the huge campaign, what we can do during this period, of our chairpersonship. Uh, so, uh, you know, it's the ultimate irony. Absolutely. I thank you for this interview, Mr. Ram. And I thank you in particular for addressing each of the criticisms made either by Mr. Bakshi, the foreign ministry spokesperson, or by these unidentified but senior officials who spoke to every single paper in the country. I thank you. Thank for you for time. having me, Karan. Thank you for having me on this. It was a pleasure. Take okay. care. Hi, I'm Karan Thapar. Over the last few years, I hope you've been watching my program, The Interview on The Wire. During that period, I've interviewed doctors, politicians, businessmen, scientists, authors, and even the occasional Nobel laureate. For me, it's been exciting. I hope it's been enjoyable for you. But these, as you know, are tough times. And if this program is going to remain bold, independent, and sometimes even defiant, then I think we need your support. At the end of the day, it's a truism, but editorial independence is best defended by the viewers. So if you would like this program to remain the way it is, forthright, outspoken, and interesting, then would you consider supporting us? All you have to do is to click on the description at the bottom. But more than anything else, I hope you will continue to watch the interview. Your viewership means an awful lot to me.